Depends on the girl, right? Okay. Uh, you tell me some teenage girl characteristics. General, we're going to make a general, sweeping generalization. What do teenage girls do most of their time? Talk. Talk about what? Boys. Boys, okay. How, how profitable to life is talking about boys? How useful is it? I mean, what does it produce? If you think about it, okay, to me, you tell me what are some marks, what are some marks of adulthood or maturity? Responsibility, responsibility right? Shouldering responsibility. Okay, responsibility could be productivity, couldn't it? Okay, a person who is productive, do they are they are they concerned with self-preservation or contribution? Yeah, well, at least take care of yourself, but, you know, contribute, you know, produce something for the team, right? Okay, so when a, teen, when a teenage girl says, those boys are so immature, does she mean they're not working jobs? Probably not. Does she mean, uh, you know, they don't have a good game plan for, you know, Supporting families, and she could mean that sort of. But I mean, who has that expectation of teenage boys? So what does she mean? When the girl says those boys are so mature. They're not paying attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. Uh, you know, they're probably acting goofy or silly or teasing or you know, being childlike. Could a mature person be goofy? Could a guy go to work, shoulder his load of work? and uh, tease his wife at home? Sure. Does that really mean he's not mature? You know, uh, immaturity is not not being responsible, not being what you ought to be. I think it, the, it, you're, what they're talking about is personality. In other words, I'd like the boy to act like this. I'd like him to sit down and go, you know, the goo goo on me, or whatever it is, you know. Um, are teenage boys immature? Yes, they yes. Are. compared to adults, certainly. When you say, are teenage girls immature? Even physically. Yeah, physically. Yeah, they're immature in every way. Girls and and, down on and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, Dr. Bill Rice one time was talking about teenage boys and girls liking each other, and he was using microphones for an example. And he took <laughs> he took one microphone. He's like, so you got a boy and a girl, and he faces them at each other. And he's like, no, it's more like this. <laughs> he takes the girl's microphone and then points it down. <laughs> About 12 years old, yeah, most teen girls are taller than their boys. I was looking at a faith Christian school picture of me in ninth grade uh, a while back. It's on Facebook. And I was the same height as the girls in our class that were short. I think they were all mostly short. Uh, but Lee was probably like five inches taller than me at the time. And... Uh, you know, I was, I was 14, 15 years old. At 16, I think I was like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, you know, so I was very immature. <laughs> and the reality of it is, is that that's what you're talking about. That isn't maturity. When somebody makes a comment about somebody's external behavior who's a Christian and questions whether or not they're actually a Christian, they're the concision. In other words, they're cutting somebody up and they're kind of cutting them up for something that is for something that's probably just natural in them. Um, how much desire should a new Christian have to be godly? As much as it as anybody ought to have, right? Usually more when they're first born. Well, sometimes that happens, but I mean, if you say usually more, then you're, you're setting an expectation of what they're supposed to be like, and you're comparing them with whatever your standard is for maturity. For instance, don't we usually expect people to be like us when we went through the same stages? It's amazing how much sympathy everybody wants when they go through something. Um, 
cancer. <clears throat> One of the things I've realized with cancer patients is that no matter what kind of cancer you have, no matter what stage it was when it was found, whatever decision a person made to treat their cancer is what they think everybody else should use. In other words, if you took chemo, then if somebody has cancer, oh, do chemo. Definitely do chemo. That's the way to go. Why? Well, because it's the way for me to go. And if it worked for you, it's a good way to go. Other people don't definitely don't do chemo. Whatever you do, don't do chemo. Uh, after they've had maybe a surgery, they have it removed. You know, don't, you know, you definitely want to do your radiation afterward. Other people, whatever you do, don't do radiation. And it's all based on what decision they've made. Uh, we're that way when we go to the restaurant. I mean, if, if we have something on the menu that we think is the best thing, then it's like we want to be validated by somebody else saying that's the best thing on the menu. Because we want our opinion, the way, what we think, to be what other people think. And a part of it is just about us. It's about our self-validation. Here, people, when I got saved, one of the first things I did, well, a lot of that has to do with what you got saved from. Right? I mean, I, one of the first things I did when I get, got saved was not to put away my pack of cigarettes. It wasn't the first thing I did. At four years old, I hadn't even smoked yet. Still haven't. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the thing for me. But for some people, that's a sign of real conversion. That's an evidence that you, you indeed were born again, was that you put away your cigarettes. <coughs> you know, some people don't... You know, the, smoking isn't the thing that's destroying their lives. It's just not the thing that's destroying them. Other things are destroying them. And maybe, maybe comparatively, smoking cigarettes is the, the least of anything. Long hair. I remember when I was a young Christian, and I mean young in every sense because I was a young person, I remember going into church, and they talked about people getting saved and cutting their hair. You know, he cut his, he got, he cut his hair, you know. And they used to preach it against long-haired hippies. Uh, when I was... Now, now, folks in our generation don't even know what a long-haired hippie is. And I didn't even really know much of what a hippie was. I knew people with long hair, but they probably, a lot of them weren't hippies, you know. <laughs> uh, the concision is a group of individuals that comes in and tries to take the law and really, literally cuts people up, just cuts up their life, just finds fault and cuts them up, tells them, makes a standard of living. And so Paul makes a point here. <coughs> I've had people say, boy, you know, Paul never sounds more arrogant than in Philippians <coughs> chapter 3. Well, let me ask you a practical question. If this is the same Paul, and it is, who said that he counted himself to be the chiefest of sinners, do you think he's forgotten his sinful past when he talks about how he kept the law? Well, let's bring it into perspective then. How could Paul in Philippians 3 talk about confidence in the flesh? Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin. He knew what tribe he was. Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's touching the law of Pharisee. <coughs> zeal. He, concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Literally the thing that made him the chiefest of sinners from the position of being, good, of being a Pharisee is what made him righteous. Isn't that interesting? Saul said, the most evil thing I did was out of my zeal as a Pharisee. Christian, I want us to think about this. I am not today, you don't misunderstand me, I am not today saying that for believers there are no evils, there is no good and there is no bad. That as believers we ought to have standards that separate us from the world. And that we that those standards to some degree are not universal. <coughs> Listen, I'll just tell you something. There is a such thing as Christian liberty and there's also such a thing as common sense. And common sense really isn't Christian liberty. You get you know what I'm saying? 
when I'm talking about things we ought to do or things we should do, the doctrine of biblical separation, we could, we could argue about how it is practiced, but it ought to be debatable about whether or not it's a Bible teaching. You understand what I'm saying? Should not Christians be separate from the world? Does the Bible teach that? Yes. Yes. Should the church be distinct from the world? Does the Bible teach that? Yes. Are there ways that the church could carry that out that could be debatable? Sure. Uh, I grew up in an era of... Fun I'm a fundamentalist to the core, unapologetically a fundamentalist, but I grew up in an era of fundamentalism where I believe that most fundamentalists didn't know that... Most fundamentalists didn't know what the fundamentals of the faith were. They thought they were behaviors. They thought they were the way you dress. Listen, I know preachers... Well, I'm wearing a white shirt today. I qualify. I know preachers that don't think that a man ought to wear a dress shirt that isn't a white shirt. I know pastors that won't let somebody preach on their platform unless he's wearing a white shirt. Not a blue shirt, not a yellow shirt. We're not talking about shirt and tie. We're talking about white shirt, no pinstripes. And sure don't wear a blue shirt with a white collar or something like that. You know, none of that wild, crazy stuff. And I'll just be honest with you. I am of the school of thought that a, re a dress shirt is a white shirt. That's my opinion. Yeah, Taj has a nice looking shirt on here this morning, but it's not a dress shirt. Great for work, but it's, you know, great for looking good, but it's not a dress shirt, it's blue. I have blue shirts because my wife makes me wear them. She bought them for me. I didn't have, I, for dress shirts, I didn't, before I got married, I didn't have any but white shirts. I'm a fundamentalist all the way through. Okay, do you think for one minute that I'm of the impression that a person's doctrine is in question because of the color of shirt he wears? No. That's just an executive thing. That's just a dress thing. You look at people that are dressing, you look at people that are actually <coughs> dressing as an executive, dressing professionally, and when they're full, all, all in, they're fully professional dress, they're going to wear a white shirt. It's just a standard. It's a standard for a profession. That's all it is. And there are preachers who said, you know what, a pastor ought to look sharp, and he ought to dress executive. And all of a sudden it became a doctrine that pastors have to wear white shirts. And that's stupid. You get what I'm saying? In other words, as a believer, we need to understand that there are biblical standards for how we live. But when we come to the place that the way that we've practiced something or carried it out, the way that we've practiced it or carried it out is... The is the rule or the standard. We, we've forgotten the why of the how we do it, right? Uh, modesty and distinction ought to be part of dress, shouldn't it? <coughs> do we agree on this? Do we agree on it? Does everybody here think that a man ought to be modest? I think so. Does everybody here think that a lady ought to be modest? I think so. Do we have to agree on how that's carried out? <coughs> No, I think we could we could agree at a basic level what modesty is, right? I'll tell you something, the distinction issue is more of an issue than I ever thought it would be. The pants that men wear today, I remember my wife used to say, you know, I never understood, you know, why they'd say that, you know, women wearing pants is putting on that which pertain to a man. You know, it used to be that men wore pants, ladies wore dresses, that sort of thing. There were certain activity clothing that you would wear. Um, and I understand that. But I'm just tell you something. Men wear pants that look like women's pants today. Form-fitting pants. Not even form-fitting, form-shaping pants men wear today. And they're absolutely disgusting. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody's a man would be caught dead in them would they would they knit? See you guys know. Paint on pants. What's that? Paint on pants. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't even want to describe them. <laughs> they call them skinny jeans. Skinny pants. Men don't do skinny. There was a time when Al wouldn't even wear pants and had pleats in it. He wouldn't wear pleats? No way. Nicely done, Al. <laughs> Pleated <laughs> pants? Yeah, I mean, they put, that's like a ruffle, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 
but, you, but Al doesn't understand what uh, people who are not, you know, slender understand about pleats. You know, they hide, hide a multitude of sin. <laughs> Give you a little bit of stretch. Bill <laughs> Rice still does that. Where's pleats? I don't think he does. Yeah, he's old school. He won't go to the mall in jeans. He'll come over to your house in jeans, but he won't go to the mall. I remember we were going to a teen activity. He came by my house. You want to go to the mall with us? We're going to a teen activity. Yeah, that'd be. His wife's like, yeah, that'd be fun. And he's like, no, I, I, I'm not dressed right. He's wearing, you know, blue jeans. And his wife said, he still thinks you got to wear khakis or whatever to go to the mall. That's the way he's raised. And, that, and that's the way everybody was raised. You ever watch Leave it to Beaver? <laughs> you know? I was serious. They were just, that was just how people do Okay, I don't want to get silly about dress. But folks, the fact of the matter is that how a thing is carried out can get caught up in just a cultural norm. And what had happened in the church at Philippi and, and Paul's final thing was to watch out for this. Watch out for a spirit that creeps up that looks for a behavior instead of a spirit. And this is what Paul points out here, the phrase in <coughs> verse 3. He said, We are the circumcision which worship God in the... What's that next word? In the spirit. For I'll tell you something, the spirit that in manner that you and I have about something is everything. It really is. You know, there are many individuals who just have a bad spirit about them. Have a bad spirit about them. They may be correct about what they look like, what they dress like, what they act like, but they're not correct in their spirit. i just tell you something. You're looking to be critical of somebody. You don't love them. You don't love them. You really don't. You're looking to find something wrong with somebody. You don't have a love for them. Your motivation is not, I love them and I want them, want what's best for them. Paul goes on to say, he said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he have whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Now Paul is not here saying, hey listen, I made it as a Pharisee. I made it as, as a, a, an individual who kept the law. He's just saying, if you want to compare yourselves, I can compare. I know what tribe I'm from. There's nothing wrong with being born from the tribe of Benjamin, though they had a pretty sordid history in the early days. He was a Pharisee, stayed under Gamaliel. He was respected. He was zealous. He was devoted in his life and in his time. It actually took Paul's time, resources, and attention to persecute the Christian Jews. It actually cost him time and resource. But it gained him respect. It gained him prestige. It gained him a position. He goes on to say in verse 7, though, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dog that I may win Christ. For any believer who believes that physical success is the evidence of a real faith in God. Paul defied that comprehension entirely. Listen, do you think that Paul is preaching the prosperity gospel here? It's surely not. Where is he? In prison. He's in bonds. What's his outlook? Probably doesn't happen. I mean, the truth of the matter is, when you're in prison for your faith, the prospect of even living was dim. The idea that you would even survive, live to see another day, was dim. And as he writes this letter to Philippi from prison in Rome, it looks as though this is it for Paul, as though he's had it. And Paul said, the things that look like success are not. And the things that look like failure actually are. Christian, you and I need to really know for God, know between us and God what success and failure actually is. 
You know, you may give everything to God and find out you still get to live in a house. You know what I'm talking about? You can give everything to God and still get to live in your home. Or you may not. Depending on where God wants you to live. Get it? You can live for God and God can give you promotion at work. And you can have a uh, you can have a lucrative income and money in the bank, <clears throat> unless God doesn't want that. And what God wanted for Paul was prison. And what Paul is simply saying here is that success or failure is not determined on the outward appearance. Success or failure is determined by worshiping God in the Spirit, by having a circumcision in the Spirit. In other words. Being willing to be what God wants you to be. Believer, have you ever settled that with God? Have you ever said, God, <clears throat> I know what the expectation of people is. You ever been called to ministry? This, this happens for people that are, that are in my vocation. I, I knew at an early age that I was called to be a pastor. And you know that as a pastor, people question your success or your failure based on the size of the church you pastor? They do. You know, are you successful on the basis of where you pastor and what's the size of your church? And you know something? If a person begins to look that way and you begin to look at people that way, you could really make some judgments that are probably not accurate, couldn't you? I have, uh, I think sometimes of uh, Dr. Rick Flanders. How many of y'all remember Dr. Rick Flanders? No hands. Several of you do. One of the, I think most, one of, one of the in-depth preachers of our day, one of the guys that just really can expound the Scripture and preach the Word of God, and I think probably one of the most disciplined preachers of his era. You know where he pastored for most of his ministry was Junietta Baptist Church in, that uh, was in Vassar, Michigan. Out in the boonies. And I mean the boondocks. And you know it wasn't a very big church. And Dr. Rick Flanders, especially toward the end of his ministry there, began to be sought after to preach all around the United States. I mean, literally churches would have him come in and preach on, on different things because he really was a scholar and a, of, of really a foremost of his peers preaching on certain topics and matters, particularly the area of revival and to being spirit-filled. And yet he pastored a small church in Vassar, Michigan. When he resigned his church, when the Lord led him to do that after, I, I want to say it was almost uh, 40 years of being in that ministry, big ministries all over the place tried to get him to come as the head of their ministry. <coughs> And it just, it, one of the things about it is it's just very telling. Just because he was in a small church didn't mean that he wasn't a good preacher. That he wasn't a good scholar, wasn't a, wasn't a qualified man. One of the best, he's one of the best guys I know as far as Sunday school classes, just to have a very well operated Sunday schools in his church. Just a great ministry. And you're going to evaluate him based on man's standards, you say, yeah, not much. Not so much. And that's true of a lot of people, a lot of individuals. You look at individuals and you look at their ministry and you try to evaluate. You know people do that with Christians too. You pull up to the church parking lot and they look at your car. <laughs> they see you know, what year it is, what model it is, whether it's a luxury model, whether it's a utility model, and they, just, they, they determine things about you, about each other. Somebody gets saved and they try to figure out what their standing is, what their status is. You know, what kind of a job do they work? What do you think their income is? And everybody compares themselves. And friend, that's what the world does. That's what the concision does. But that's not what a person who has got Christ in their spirit does. And Paul points out <coughs> the attitude. <coughs> Paul said in verse 8, he said, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Do you notice he talks about all these things, righteousness which is in the law, zeal. He talks about the status he was born in. 
And then he goes on to say that that is all loss. You know what loss means? Paul isn't just saying I lost those things. He's not saying that. Sometimes people talk about what they gave up to follow Jesus, and Paul is not going there. He's not saying I gave up all this and I count it as lost. I lost it for Jesus. No, Paul is saying I count that as and the idea here of loss is loser. The idea here is a person who does that's a loser. And my attitude toward that is if that were my status and my standing, that would be loss. In other words, I'd be a capital L O S E R loser. Instead of that, he said, I gain the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Friend, Jesus is everything. And He must be our everything. And this is not a philosophical approach or way of thinking, my friend. This is the fact. The fact is, is that any person who thinks that he is a, a, a perfect person, a law-keeping person, a qualified person, a devoted person, a good person, any person thinks, I'm a great Pharisee and that's really something, is a loser because he doesn't know what Jesus is. Is so it the excellency? Do you see the word loser next to excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> My Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but done. Again, that idea is, you know, Paul is saying the word suffer here is allowed. I've, I've allowed the loss of all things. The word suffer here isn't just I'm in prison and I'm hurting. The word suffer here is the word that is used in the English language for allow. And so Paul is not saying this is a this has happened to me. He's saying this is something that I've done when I've allowed the loss of all things. See, we don't use the word suffer the same way today. Today we use the word suffer like a person who's persecuted. But Jesus used the word suffer as suffer a little child to come unto me. Allow. You see the difference in how we think about this? Sometimes we read a passage of Scripture where Paul is talking about losing things. We think, boy, poor Paul. Because he followed Jesus, he lost everything. No. Paul allowed the loss of all things. Why? He said, because I do count them but dumb. I hope we know what the definition of the word dumb is. Excrement or waste. It's filth. It is, uh, it's, it's good for nothing but mulch. And only after it's rotted out. Dumb. Paul said that's what that stuff is. A bunch of garbage. Not perhaps a polite way of putting it, but friend, I'll just tell you something. If you're all about the looks, if you're all about appearance, you know, it's ironic to me, but we have substituted we've substituted looks for looks today. There is something about hip church leadership today that just kills me. It just cracks me up. But if you're not if you're not hip, you're not with it. It's funny that church leadership tries to be hip. But you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you got First of all, you got to paint the back of the stage black and put some, uh, I guess if you take some crates, you know, some crates and stack them around, maybe some crates and some pallets, paint some pallets black and just, you know, this <laughs> is funny because I have friends I know, they've got pallets on their wall, you know, behind the, you know, behind the platform. And you just, you think about it logically. You think, why do pallets need to be on the wall behind the platform? Because it's hip. That's why pallets are cool right now. I like just posting pictures of anything and saying, I made this out of some old pallets. It's just really fun to do. Because that's like, you know, you go on Pinterest and everybody's got their pallet, this, pallet, that. I made this out of pallets. Pallets are like the coolest thing ever, right? And old crates, like stuff that was trash. Well, if you're hip, you got pallets on your platform. And if you're hip, you have an untucked shirt, you wear jeans and either flip-flops 
or boat shoes, something like that. Now you're pretty cool because you always got boat shoes on, don't you? But uh, your shirt's not right. I'm sorry. That collar and all that <coughs> stuff just that can't can't happen. Anyway, and Starbucks. There's something about paying you know five dollars for a drink that only you know how to order. It's like really hip, but you know what I'm talking about. And I have friends. I have contemporary <coughs> friends. Who are in the ministry that I'm just not cool because I don't speak that I hate to talk like gibberish. Yeah, there's like a talk to it. Anyway, my point is this: that has replaced the white shirt and collar. In other words, you're, you, nobody would think anything of you as a preacher because you don't know how to dress him. And it's really true. And it says every bit as ridiculous as, the, as what it replaced. In other words, on the one hand, there was this formality that was qualification for godliness, proof that you're what you're supposed to be inside. And now there is a flippancy that's the exact same thing, and all it is is a substitution. It's its behavior that's valued. And my friend, that's concision. <coughs> you get it? Listen, if, if God wants you to wear jeans, wear jeans for crying out loud. If God wants you to wear a suit and you've got a good reason for doing it, wear a suit. That doesn't mean anything about the Spirit. You see what I'm saying? You see what Paul's saying? And Paul said all of the things that mean so much that people look at and think and evaluate don't mean anything. He said, I, I suffer. I allow those to be lost for Jesus Christ. That I may know Him. And the power of His resurrection. Chris, I want to ask you a practical question. Do you know what Paul means when he says the power of His resurrection? That I may know the power of His resurrection. If Paul were to say, I have experienced the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Could you say me too? Me too. We're not talking about just salvation here. We're talking about a mindset that said this is for losers and Jesus is for winners and the result of making that decision to follow Jesus has caused me to know the power of His resurrection. And Paul said, being made conformable unto his death. He said, for me, the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that it molded me to his suffering. And for Paul, that was power. Paul talked early in Philippians, didn't he, about other individuals and about the preaching of the gospel and some people preached it against him, preached it out of envy and strife, some pre people preached it. They preached it because they wanted to just see people come to Christ. You know, one of the things Paul many times said was that I made this for your sakes. <laughs> in other words, Paul clearly understood that every person who was following Jesus wasn't supposed to be in prison. Can you imagine that? I've got to follow Jesus. I've got to be like Paul now. I've got to figure out a way to go to jail. In other words, I'm not trying to be like Paul. I don't need to have a sickness to qualify. I don't need to be in prison to qualify. I need to have the power of Christ's resurrection in me. In other words, I need to be real. And he said, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained you, we're already perfect. Now he's speaking, he's speaking of what he was in times past. He said, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. What does it mean to apprehend? What? To capture the grasp. To capture a grasp, to understand all those words. Paul said, if I could just get it. In verse 13, he said, Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended. I haven't gotten it. I haven't arrived. I'm not there. But this one thing I do, he said, forgetting those things which are behind. What's Paul forgetting which is behind him? 
trials in his uh, past years? His past years, when he was a what? When he was a Pharisee. He said, I'm going to forget the things that are fleshly <coughs> success. And he said, reaching forth unto those things which are before me. You know, Christian, it isn't past and it isn't present for a follower of Jesus Christ. It's future. There's nothing brighter than future, is there? There's nothing more hopeful than future. So many times I talk to people and they say there's no hope. You know why? They don't see anything ahead that's better than what they're at. They don't see anything ahead that's better than where they've been. And Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's a future event. Christian, if you could just apprehend, if you could just get a hold of what it is that Paul is saying here and just get a hold of knowing the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your future would be brighter than your present. And your future will be brighter than your past. And the older you get, the more of an encouragement that will be. Some of you may be still... Uh, maybe you're, 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 the days of your physical strength being at its peak are still ahead. Maybe your, your uh, looks and your beauty... Maybe the pinnacle of that is yet to come. But for those of us that are well beyond that, isn't it great to know that that isn't our high point and everything isn't downhill from there? But that our high point is when we receive the prize for following Jesus Christ. And that's our future. And you can start anywhere. You can begin anywhere rest toward the mark. So that's where we'll end today. And uh, Lord willing, we'll conclude <coughs> in two weeks from now. I won't be here this next Sunday, so y'all don't have to come to church. I won't know if you're here or not. So it won't make any difference. you know. And that's I know that somewhere in heaven there's a record that uh, is based on what I know, not what God knows. Right? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you for the, the people that are here today, for the spirit that's here, your spirit. Father, I pray that you would help us to desire to apprehend that which is in Christ Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.